Malignant individuals and groups use various methods to try and force their targets into submission. Each method attempts to induce its own distinctive psychological deterrent. Some try to arouse shame. Others try to instill a sense of helplessness and dependence. Others are designed to create intense confusion, but the aim is always the same. To train targets to doubt their own judgment and stop them thinking for themselves. Manipulators can then gradually impose their rules, rules they can change any time they like, which the target will come to accept without question. Manipulators can also isolate the target away from the people who could help them escape. Targets of manipulative groups experience this developmental process in reverse. They learn to take smaller steps. They are discouraged from engaging with the outside world, which is portrayed as hostile and dangerous. They're taught that good only exists within the group. Their self-reliance decreases and their world shrinks. Piece by piece, they surrender their autonomy. They'll be instructed to do things that arouse great anxiety and distress, even heartbreak, like demonizing good people and shunning loved ones who disagree with the group. They'll be told they need to be brave and not give in to these misguided emotions. The group is their real family. But their emotions aren't misguided. The pain they feel is evidence of their humanity, their abiding sense of fairness, compassion and justice. But these qualities are antagonistic to groups who seek one thing from their targets, compliance. And targets will be repeatedly forced to choose between being loyal to the group and being true to their humanity. That choice is perhaps never more stark than when a target becomes aware that a child from the group has made an allegation of sexual abuse against another member. Is the target's first thought for the child's welfare or the group's image? Their answer will provide a gauge of their humanity, even under divine oath. Many high-control ideological groups teach their members that it's fine to employ deception in certain circumstances. Deception can even become an official policy with its own special name. In Berg's group, it was called Deceivers Yet True. Rules were laid out about what kinds of deception were acceptable. Deceiving other family members was strictly forbidden, as was deceiving for selfish motives, like avoiding punishment for wrongdoings. But non-members, who were considered to be serving the devil, were said to have no right to the truth. The most effective way to conceal child abuse is to ensure the children never make any allegations, not even to those they're taught to trust. When an allegation is made, other cover-up tactics are required. Sometimes allegations can be buried before they become public. Accusers can be bribed and or threatened. A method employed by the Catholic Church to cover up child molestation by its clergy. Sometimes damning evidence can be altered or destroyed. Once an allegation has been made public, other strategies come into play, including various forms of denial. The accused can simply lie and deny the allegation flat out. They can deny knowledge or recall of the offence. They can deny that the offence comes within their sphere of responsibility, or that the offence is as serious or far-reaching as their accusers allege. Another strategy is evasion. The accused might try to avoid being questioned wriggling out of court attendance by claiming illness or bereavement, or they might falsely claim some duty of secrecy, which prevents them sharing damning material. In some groups, new members are given different names. This happened with Natasha Tournay's abuser, Clay, who'd been rebaptized to reflect Berg's idea that members should be moldable, like clay on a potter's wheel. Blurring identities can help abusers evade justice. Some defendants choose to go on the offensive with counter-accusations, attacking their accusers' character and motives, claiming their rights are being violated, claiming unfair prejudice or persecution. Maybe the most slippery strategies are the ones involving misdirection, otherwise known as smoke and mirrors, which direct our attention to the wrong place with misleading or irrelevant information. Angus asks Jeffrey, does your church accept corporal punishment for children? Jeffrey replies, Our church expects parents to discipline and raise their children. This is misdirection, completely bypassing the central question of corporal punishment. 
by answering an unasked question of Jeffrey's own invention. Meaningless phrases can be used to give a parody of answering while saying nothing. Zara asks Jag, does your group have any female leaders? The truth is, his group doesn't accept female leaders. To try and cover up that truth, he replies, women are crucial. This statement is meaningless. It doesn't specify how women are crucial. To get the authorities off their backs, abusive groups will sometimes fake interest in reformation. They'll promise to consider the recommendations of official judicial panels and undertake to introduce new safeguards. But it's just word games. There is no intention to change, and the abuse will go on. A number of these tactics have been repeatedly used by senior Jehovah's Witnesses to try and cover up hundreds of cases of child molestation within their organization and the doctrines that have helped to perpetuate that abuse. Denial is nothing new to the leaders of the separatist Christian group, Jehovah's Witnesses, whose religious symbol is a watchtower. Any religious group in the habit of predicting the end of the world inevitably becomes practiced at cover-up techniques when their prophecies fail, as they invariably do. For the children of God, Armageddon was predicted to arrive in 1993. For Jehovah's Witnesses, numerous termination dates spanning over a century have come and gone including the year 1975. Like David Berg, the Jehovah's Witness leadership, known as the governing body, produces a range of publications to convey their ideas, including their magazines Awake and The Watchtower. Those publications heavily pushed the 1975 end time prediction. The year was derived using biblical chronology to calculate the date of the supposed first human, Adam, at 4026 BCE. Then, adding 6,000 years, the allotted time for humanity's existence. According to the governing body, at the end time, only members of Jehovah's organization would qualify for eternal life. The rest would be annihilated. In 1969, Awake magazine told young people they needed to face the fact they would never grow old in the present system and never fulfill any career the world had to offer. In the previous year, the Kingdom Ministry publication urged members to get into pioneering ministry for the organization, telling them there were only about 90 months left before human existence was completed. In 1974, the publication then applauded members who had sold their homes to devote themselves to pioneering, remarking that it was a fine way to spend the short time remaining before the wicked world's end. The Armageddon prediction changed many lives. Witnesses gave up opportunities in education and business. Insurance policies were cancelled. Some put off having children. What was the leadership doing? Buying new property. In the early part of 1975, humanity's final year, the organisation bought the 15-storey Towers Hotel in Brooklyn. While they were encouraging and praising huge sacrifices among their flock, they were expanding their real estate. It also altered evidence. In the 1968 edition of its publication, The Truth That Leads to Eternal Life, it quoted a prediction made in 1960 by former US Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, that in 15 years time, i.e. 1975, the world would be too dangerous to live in. But in the revised 1981 edition, the specific time frame of 15 years was conspicuously replaced with the word soon. In recent years, the governing bodies come under scrutiny for another cover-up, this time regarding child sexual abuse. The hypocrisy of this cover-up is as brazen as it gets. In a barrage of articles in Awake magazine, the governing body has repeatedly pointed a sanctimonious finger at the Catholic Church for its institutional cover-up of child molestation by its priests, noting the long-term, often permanent damage done to the child. These articles cast the governing body as a champion of children. The 2011 article correctly reported that abuse by priests was ignored because of loyalty to the absolute authority of the Catholic Church. It neglected to mention that loyalty to the Jehovah's Witness governing body, which exercises vastly greater control over its flock, has had the same silencing effect. 
1993 article accused the Catholic Church of compounding the initial sexual abuse with a second, more painful psychological abuse, the abuse of failing to listen or take accusations seriously and only protecting abusers. A 1990 article accused the Catholic Church of hushing up cases and taking no significant disciplinary action. But people in glass watchtowers really shouldn't throw stones. As I'll be showing, the Jehovah's Witness organization is also guilty on every count. The problem of child abuse isn't exclusive to any group, but it can become entrenched in groups that put up obstacles to justice. One obstacle the Jehovah's Witness governing body shares with the Catholic Church is its preening concern for reputation. Valuing public image over the welfare of their members has led both organizations to focus their energies on hiding their shame rather than tackling the abuse but the Jehovah's Witness leadership has erected other special obstacles. Through a combination of maladaptive doctrines, it's created an organization that enables molesters and exiles their prey. One doctrine that protects molesters is something called the Two Witness Rule. Based on passages from Deuteronomy and 1 Timothy, the Two Witness Rule demands that congregational leaders, called elders, have to hear the testimony of at least two witnesses to convict an abuser. Obviously, the private nature of child sexual abuse renders this condition extremely improbable. In the absence of two witnesses, a confession is required from the abuser. If no confession is made, the matter is considered to be in the hands of Jehovah. So, all abusers have to do to enjoy a life of carefree child molestation is make sure they're not seen and decline to confess. This astounding leniency in favour of the abuser isn't always evident with other offences. Shepherd the Flock of God, a judicial guidebook for elders, gives a hypothetical case in which a married man is observed to stay overnight at the house of his secretary, but denies committing adultery. Despite the fact that there are no witnesses to adultery and no confession has been obtained, it's claimed that there's strong enough circumstantial evidence of sexual impropriety to warrant judicial action and even allow the wife to divorce and remarry, which is a rare privilege among Jehovah's Witnesses, who generally equate remarriage with adultery, based on Matthew 19, verse 9. So, for adults, just seeing someone go in and out of a house is enough to establish adultery. Meanwhile, abused children need multiple witnesses or a confession. Otherwise, case closed. The governing body likes to project the image of an organization beyond reproach. To maintain this illusion, congregations are instructed to shun individuals regarded as troublesome, including close relatives. This is based on a line from 1 Corinthians, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. This doctrine might seem perfect for ridding the organization of abusers. Instead, it repeatedly works to expel the abused. that harm others, that's when all people who love truth and righteousness, that's when they should speak up.